So welcome back from the desk of low. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, but we got it worked out for y'all right now. There's a treat for me right now. As you can see, we came a long way from recording over the phone, so we, you can actually see the guest in front of me right now. If you're not familiar with him, let me fill y'all in. Um, if you're not familiar with mixtapes and that mixtape era, you really missed out on classic era right there because this is when pre-internet, pre-internet, you can still get them on the internet, but it wasn't accessible as it was today. Now this gentleman right here is part of the one of the hardest duos that hip hop has ever heard, and those mixtapes are classic right now. So, without further introductions, I'd like to introduce Hitchcock. What's up, people? What's up, y'all? It's good. It's your boy Hitch. And how you doing today, sir? Well, good, man. I'm doing swell. <laughs> Everything is good, man. Chilling. Had a long weekend. I mean, it's Sunday still, but we've been putting in a lot of work in the studio, putting together this album. That's about it. You know what I'm saying? Every day, and then at the lab, going through beats and trying to, you know, orchestrate this uh, project. Okay. You know, so put it out to people. So you're coming out with a project now. Okay. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I want to gotcha. take it. I want to take it back to where it all began for Hitch. Now, um, so I understand that you were inspired by ra rhyming by your cousins, and that how you got the name Hitchcock was is because you used to tell ill stories like that. So it only made sense. Yeah. So basically, I got the name from DJ Enough um, back in the day, years ago, like when I first uh, moved to Teaneck High School from Jersey City. You know, I'm born and raised in Jersey City. Uh, I met uh, Lady Luck, which is a, a rap artist, and we became very close, and she started a label, uh, Cazones, basically. She was trying to start her own little group, and I was a part of it. So she used to bring me to Def Jam all the time. She was one of the first people to ever bring me up uh, to the record labels, and that's when I really got fixated on trying to get a record deal and taking uh, music seriously, because I saw she had acquired a, a deal through Def Jam, so I was like, wow, I have an opportunity here, and um, DJ Enough at the time was, uh, he was a and ring her project, her album. Okay. And, uh, I used to rap for him all the time, and rap on the beats, you know, we were trying to find the beats that would be dope for her, for her album and stuff, so I would rap over the beats that were submitted and stuff, and he just said I had a narrative type of style, he was like, your name should be Hitchcock, and it just stuck, so that's how I got that name. Damn, I never knew DJ Enough gave you the name Hitchcock. I thought it was like somebody, somebody from your family and all, but damn, okay, shout out to DJ Enough, we see you. Shout out to DJ Enough, for real, yup. He gave me that name, he's like, your name should be like Hitchcock, and it stuck. Everybody just called me Hitch since then, you know what I'm saying? Wow, so you started off with Lady Luck right there. That was actually in my notes now, too, because I understand that when you were coming back, like you at one point started a record company, or you were signed to one called um, Presidential Beats? Yeah, Presidential Beats, I started that company with Orlando uh, Wharton and uh, Miz, uh, Brooklyn Miz, cat from Brooklyn. Okay. And uh, yeah, we started that label together and yeah, and, and it grew from there, from that point. Obviously, we needed production, yeah. so uh, a former, uh, basically, not a former, he's still DJ, his name is Nelly Nell, he's ill. He's like a DJ, but he also is a producer. So we got Nelly Nell down with the team along with uh, Mayor, Jeff and Mayor. Okay. He's, he was our engineer. And uh, also Tuesday. I don't want to forget Carl. Carl was another piece to the puzzle. And then also Zerk, who this guy, you know, Zerk was ill. He, his record collection is insane. So we used to get a lot of samples and digging in the crates. That's how you get the records like Candy. These are like records from way back that, that you hear, like original A-Team songs. The real oldies, though. Whenever we did like those old remakes, we got those uh, records from Zerk. But um, yeah, that's how we started. And then Ransom obviously uh, was brought on uh, with Mayer because he already was a rap artist. We were both solo artists, and Mayer was previously doing music with Mayer already. So by Mayer becoming my engineer, we were able to meet and do music together. And then, you know, he, eventually he became part of uh, Presidential Beats as well, and we just moved together as a unit. It just made more sense than everybody doing their separate thing. Damn, okay. So it was like a dream team, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. It was really dope. Fun times, memorable, memorable, very memorable moments. Oh, I bet, too. Because like, I can only imagine like this time now, too, because 
the internet wasn't so accessible as it is nowadays. Because nowadays, like, anyone could just, like, start making music within, like, like a laptop or their phone. But then you actually have to go to the studio and actually come prepared and things like that. Like, it was, it was a different time. It was a very different era. Actually, we used to spend nights in the studio. Like, that was, like, it was like our playground. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. our playhouse. Go, I, I love the studio. I still do to this day. Just going in there, being able to create, you know what I'm saying? Break at night, like we really grinded, really grinded very hard, and just to to make the music. But once you have that body of music, it's awesome because you know you're working without pressure, really, because yeah. you have so much music. You're just constantly creating. So that's really what was happening there. You know what I'm saying? If one of us wasn't in the studio, and you know, once you get there, something new was there. You're gonna jump on a new record. It just always was exciting because you never know what you're gonna hear or what you're gonna get. Or who's going to pop up at the studio? You know what I'm saying? This, the studio that we operated out of at that time was 350 Morgan Street, which is downtown Jersey City. Okay. And uh, basically, you know, I've seen the likes of everybody through that studio. You know, Puffy, Ice-T. You know um, so there was multiple studios there, not just ours. Okay. And you know, just on that floor, there probably was about six, six studios, six or seven studios, Damn. you know? So, you know, you run into people there all the time. It was like uh, K-Mac and Bless. There's some, like, producers. They, they produce on a lot of big projects. And, um, yeah, I was able to do some work with them as well. But, yeah, you never know what you're going to run into when you go into the studio down there. Now, I very can, active at that time. So I can only imagine, like, the sparring sessions now, too, because, like, was this, like, before or after, like, the Cypher Sounds or Host and Mixtape, Hitchcock Presents? Like, was this made, like, during this time? Or was this like kind of after? Wow, you know your stuff, man. Actually, that was the first mixtape. So when we formed Presidential Beats, you know, that that's what we put our energy into. I was the first artist, obviously, Hitchcock. So it was like, okay, Hitchcock Presents. Yeah, And that sense. was the name of the first CD that I ever dropped, you know. So oh, that, that was like the CD. you mixtape from Presidential Beats. It was called Hitchcock Presents. It was like an all-black cover with just like a silhouette of me with, with a big <laughs> fitted cap on. Back then, I used to wear these like oversized fitted. So it was just like a silhouette. I remember those oversized fitted. I feel you. <laughs> yeah, and Cypher Sounds, like I said, you never know who you're going to run into down in the studio. Cypher Sounds used to do some work out of K-Mac and Bless's studio, which was across the hall from us. So I was able to meet him, and obviously we kept our beats knocking. So oh, yeah. from our studio room, you're going to hear that when you're coming down the hallway. So he heard the music and was like, who's that? And I met Cypher Sound for the first time. This is when Funk Flex was like, Cypher, don't get gas. So he <laughs> yeah. was just coming in and right, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, damn, we got Cypher Sounds here. I got to get him to host a mixtape. So he heard the music, he rocked with it, and he hosted a mixtape for us, man, free of charge. He was like, yo, Damn. I'm getting over for you, and he did it. And that was the first project from Presidential Beats, was Hitchcock Presents, and it was hosted by Cypher Sounds. What a, what a like, mixtape to get hosted by like, like a DJ like him, like, especially for your first mixtape. Yeah, it was awesome. It was an awesome feeling, you know what I'm saying? And then he wanted to do it, so it wasn't like it was payola. Yeah, you know, he it felt it. That. He was like, wow, this it shit is hard. Yeah. yeah, he felt the records, and I mean, he really hosted this mixtape. Like, if you, ever, if you guys ever find it, it's just like every record, he has something to say. He's introducing it, there's an outro. He's introducing it, like he really was there, you know, hosting his mixtape for me. Shout out to Sight the Sounds, man. And shout out to Cypher Sounds right there. You're a legend for that first Mexican for Hitch. So, so I understand now, too, like, cause like what you said, you spent day in and day out within the studio now, too. So was this, like, you were crafted Hitchcock Presents and then came Hardware Classics because, like, kind of butted came in. It sounds like you, you guys kind of sound good on a record together. Like, you guys should actually do something right there. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So when we were formulating uh, the Hitchcock Presents mixtape, obviously you're always going to look to get features on it. So, yeah. you know, I, I was known in, in my city, but we needed to be known on a broader spectrum, like in New York City. So we started looking to do like features, like seeing who we can get as far as features. At this time, Joe Buttons was popping. So um, Joe Buttons is obviously from Jersey City. I was familiar with him, you know what I'm saying? And he's familiar with my cousins. So my cousins who inspired me to rap, they had rival rap groups back in the day. He was part of a group called the, the Pharmacy, 
And then my cousins had a group called the Medicine Cabinet. So you can see the likeness between the two. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it wasn't like any real beef, but it was just like a lyrical thing. And then they all went to Lincoln High School, which is a high school in Jersey City that I also attended my freshman and sophomore year there as well. And uh, Joe Buttons attended Lincoln High School as well. So obviously they were all artists and used to rhyme and ciphers outside of school. So everybody was kind of familiar with each other. So uh, me and uh, Joe Buttons, we had some common friends. Yeah. Uh, Kate was one of them. And he's like a cousin to me. And he was able to bring Joe Buttons down to the studio. First, he actually took me to Joe Buttons' house, actually. And um, I was able to meet Joe Buttons and rap for him and really get more personal with him. You know, not just know him through my cousins type yeah. of thing. Like at the and, field, um, out, like as an individual. Exactly. And from that point, he was like, I'm gonna come down to the studio. And he came down to the studio and he jumped on a, uh, he jumped on a, what beat was that? I think it was the Terror Squad beat at that time. Okay. And he jumped on it. So he's actually on Hitchcock Presents. You'll see him on that first mixtape from Presidential Beats and he's featured on it. And um, yeah, that's how that came about. Once he jumped on that mixtape as a feature, I was able to basically do a listening party. Like, we all excited. Joe Buttons had just got his deal at the time. So we were just excited to let him hear what we created in the studio, like let him listen to our full project. And as he's listening to the records, I had two features on there with Ransom, because obviously he was an artist as well, solo artist working with Maya. And we did two records together and put it on that project as well once joe buttons heard those records he just was ecstatic he just felt like yo y'all sound great together like yo i think we said you know what I'm saying he said i think we should try to do a project like all three of us and let's just see what we come up with because he just was feeling the sound and the grip of it you know what i'm saying yeah so um yeah that's how the a-team was formed basically just by him mentioning that and he actually stood in the studio with us for an entire week day in oh, day wow. out and we created the first A-Team mixtape, you know? So my project was completed with the Joe Buttons thing and then released, but then the A-Team one was created like right after that. And so quickly, because it's easier when you're rapping with, you know, I only got to worry about one verse and maybe a hook. Or <laughs> yeah, idea like two voice. other verses. And then you got two other beasts, they following up right behind you. The song is done like that. So that project was made so quickly. And I think it kind of like, kind of steamrolled over you know my solo thing at that time but it all worked for presidential beat so i was happy you know yeah so sort of so this was hardwood classics we're assuming that this one came out there well hardwood classics is something that me and Rand created we created hardwood classics without joe buttons okay. so the first 18 project actually i believe was a cut master c i think it was like during the holidays this had came out holiday stick up or something like that Damn, and um, I, I believe, yeah, I believe it was the Cutmaster C, was it? I believe so. You know, I could be mistaken. It was a very long time ago. Yeah. But that basically was put out through him. And um, when that hit the streets, it just went crazy, you know. And Joe Buttons went with the project before he, before he uh, did whatever he did to the mixtape, as far as him hosting it or whatever. Yeah. Or putting it out the way he to, to his resources. Um, the label was able to hear it. He brought it up to Def Jam and Skane Dollar heard it. Uh, you know, Skane was uh, working with Clue with the whole Desert Storm thing. Yeah. And they just came to the studio the very next day and just, they wanted to meet us and figure out who we were. And they immediately wanted to do like work with us from hearing that project. And um, yeah, so the Hardwood Classics happened after that, you know, wow. that all happened after that. And uh we used a lot of our own music, obviously, and a lot of the resources from uh, DJ Clue as well. DJ Clue had a lot of plugs, obviously. To that's oh, how yeah. we got a lot of the features. They were able to hear our music and be like, "Yo, I we like those guys," and we were able to get features and uh, beats from uh, a lot of the people in the industry who were popping at that time. That was all through Clue, but that's how we were able to create the Hardhood Classics uh, mixtape. At that time, jerseys were real popular. Oh you know, the yeah. Clothing. Oh, yes. So that's where the idea came from. Instead of hardwood classics, I was like, yo, hard hood classics. And then it was like, all right. So we just put a twist on it, hard hood classics. And we just did three volumes of that mixtape, which tore the streets up. Yeah, you know. Yeah, like, like, I remember seeing, like, like the tri state freestyle on the come up DVDs. Mind you, like, we're in Canada now, too. So this is why I love when artists do interviews now, too, because, like, for years, 
we always used to wonder, like, yo, how did these guys link up? Like, how did the Hard Heard Classics come up? And, like, I'll keep it all the way up with you. I thought Hard Heard Classics was the very first mix. And I didn't even know that there was another mix thing before that. So when I'm hearing this, I'm like, whoa. Yeah, it was crazy. So, yeah, there was a whole nother mixtape before that that was very crazy. And that was, uh, yeah, I believe that was the holiday holdup or something like that. And, and also Nelly Nell, because Nelly Nell was our DJ, obviously. So whatever uh, Cutmaster C did to it, is it, I, I'm not sure if it, I don't want to keep saying Cutmaster C. Is it Cutmaster C? Or maybe I need to do my research. Like a long time ago. And, um... My, my DJ Nelly Nell also put it out. So you probably could actually find that two guys through Nelly Nell. If you want to Google it, you can Google DJ Nelly Nell. And those same records, it was like two different DJs put out the same music. So that was the before Hard, Hard Hood Classics was that particular mixtape with Buttons. And that's going to be all the music that we created in that one week with Joe Buttons. And that's before, that has nothing to do with the Hard, hard uh, Hood Classics. Hard yeah. Hood Classics was me and Rand's creation. Yeah. And that was something we continued to do, like, after, like, Joe Buttons. Even though we still had a relationship with him, it was mainly, like, me and Rand putting those that, that stuff together. You'll get a lot of him and I on those records. Would you like to say, like, the first mixtape was, like, a prelude to the Hard Hood Classic between you and Rand because, like, how Absolutely. well the chemistry was? Absolutely, absolutely, because we saw already that we saw how much attention that we received from putting that mixtape out, and we was like, all right, we got to continue to wave, you know, we can't let it die out, so we had to continue, and at that time, Joe Buttons was still, you know, finishing his album. Oh, yeah. So, obviously, he has his priorities, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He has certain things that he got to get done, so he couldn't put full energy into what we were doing, so we had to do it. So that's how the Hardwood Classics, uh, Hardhood Classics, you know, started. Because me and Ram was like, yo, we can't lose steam. People are feeling this right now. We got to continue. And we just continued the wave from there. Because I remember, like, even after, like, fucking up all those computers in high school, like, trying to download this, because I seen an article. Uh, there's articles all over the internet. Y'all can look this up, too. Um, I believe it was a double XL article. It was show and prove or the source or something like that. And it had, like, you guys, as the A team in there, and that's how like I started to research all this. I was like, "Yo, so Desert Storm, Joe Budden, all right, let me let me see what this is about." And it just like it just, I was just a lifelong fan from there. Cause like to this day, like even before this podcast, I remember like 2018, we're bumping Tri-State, we're bumping like the the freestyle with like, uh, I forget what beat it is, but there's a lot of freestyles over there. But we're we're bumping so many hundreds. Yeah, yeah, like it's hard. Not even on, on Hard Hood Classics, but on these Desert Storm mixtapes that came in the 2000s. Like, it was a plethora of songs by you guys. Absolutely, absolutely. So much work, man. We put in so much work. And when I listen to those records now, it just brings back so many memories. Like, you know, those moments, like, you can never uh, get back, but it's so memorable. Memorable moments. Yeah. I think that's what ends really, uh, like, you know, the hardcore fans, 18 fans, Hitchcock fans. It's because they, they go back to those moments. When they hear those records, they remember those moments in their life where they were, you know, being yeah. in high school. And you know what I'm saying? So it just brings them back to that golden era of music. So that's just really dope that we were able to do that, you know? Like, even, like, bumping, like, I remember when that, I remember when Candy came on my dad at the, the high school dance. I was like, yo, this is, like, an 18 year old high school dance. I wish the internet was popping back then. I could just put that, pull up that old video, because... That, it's like what you said. It's a time in your life where you just remember. It just takes you back. It's like, oh, I remember that because of that song. Yeah, as soon as that song pops up. Yeah. And at that time, you know, the DVD, DVDs was popping, the street DVDs. Yeah. So we were all over those. We were on the Come Up DVD. Classic. You know, we were on all of them. So that was just a good time at that time. You know, this is before, like, YouTube and, you know, way before this internet and the technology that we have today. Yeah, you know, so... Crazy. We were basically, you know, doing this before this whole technology thing. <laughs> that, that really put the uh, the scope on us where we were being seen and, you know, people wanted to really put us on and sign us. and We were getting notar notarized, basically. So I understand, yeah. like, because at one point, y'all did get signed to Def Jam, but it didn't work out because that's when, like, that's just when the time when Jay-Z came in and did like yeah. that. 
It is. I mean, I feel like that's what happened. Obviously, that's what happened. Um, yeah, because we celebrated. I mean, we had bottles of champagne in the studio. <laughs> we thought everything went through and everything cleared, but it didn't. You know, there's a process. When you go to get a record deal, you know, you're at the boardroom and it's like 12 people sitting around a the table. They play the music. You have to perform the records that you're performing. You know what I'm saying? So we were being brought to Def Jam as basically a label, Desert Storm. So it was us, Stack Bundles. It was another girl. I think her name was Tara, wow. something like that. I forgot. And uh, we were being presented to try to get this label deal uh, through Desert Storm. So we thought it worked out. It took a few days before we got the final call back, like two days. And then we thought it went through. But then that's when everybody was like, wow, like the whole Jay-Z thing was happening where Jay-Z was becoming the president of Def Jam. And it was like, wow. And then like everybody who was up there was being like, <laughs> replaced basically yeah, yeah. yeah. the whole thing in order like you know we have, it was such a shocker to everybody nobody ever thought that a rap artist can become the president of a major label that was like that iconic was big move it was like what it's just shocked everyone and this but yeah basically he had his acts already that he was bringing up to Def Jam we know that Rihanna came from that uh deal uh Rick Ross Young Jeezy you know what I'm saying these are all platinum artists, so he obviously <laughs> knew what he was doing, and, and we weren't part of that plan. So, but but but, 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 what one. I, but what I like to bring up is that Joe, have you ever seen this uh, DVD? Let me see DMX Jay Z met the man backstage. Yeah, I've seen that DVD. Okay, yeah. so there's a scene in this. So there's a scene in this. The I was watching it the other day just for research. Um, okay. Clue is in this DVD heavy, and at one point, there's a part where Dame is grilling him about Desert Storm and the mixtapes. He's like, so if you really want to do something with it, like, you really got to, like, come on perfect. So do you think, like, like also, because I remember at a time where Desert Storm, like, they had fabulous, you guys, Paul Kane, the group, the Triangle Offense, or I think that's what it's called, Triangle Offense with uh, Paul Kane, fabulous, Joe Budden. And, like, even, like, the rats and what's killing all the soul trip. So there was a time, like, where everybody was just waiting for Desert Storm to come out with something. And, like, we got mixtapes out of this tape, but, like, everybody wanted that, like, that that one full, like, you know, album or something. Like, even, like, with DJ Envy, I think DJ Envy had, like, some of the blog parties released through Desert Storm. Yeah. The DJ Envy had Coke and News, so they were kind of part of us as well. Like, they, they used to come to the studio. We used to always record. I don't know if you guys remember them. It was Coke and News, two men. They were like a, a duo as well, like how me and Rand was. It was two solo artists that were put together, and Envy was kind of uh, working with them. I think they had Block Gang or something like that. It yeah. was called. Yeah, and we all used to run together. We always used to be in the studio and just, you know, killing everything together. You know, we were just a bunch of young wolves trying to get on and get, uh, you know, get, get, you know, recognition. Um as far as Clue, I think Clue had a deal with Def Jam because obviously he put out an album, right? It was called The Professional. So I remember right. that he, yes. he put something out. So I think Clue really started really picking up steam when Jay-Z started like really co-signing them. Remember that? It was like he was in backstage and stuff like that. You're it was part of that whole hard knock life thing. And I, I really don't know the, the ins and outs of that. I was very young at that time. That's before me. So I have no idea, but... I guess they was just trying to re-sign, I guess. I don't know if he had a one-album deal. I don't really know the, the ins and outs yeah, of that. It wasn't your honest. place. I can't speak about it, but he did put an album out called The Professional. If you guys remember, you know, you can look that up. I should do it. We weren't doing that. Yeah, that's before us, though. Yeah. But, like, the, but like what I was trying to get, because, like, I remember, like, he went on to do Professional 2 and Part 3, but, like, we wanted, like, like the gay that does it. Like, we wanted Raz, we wanted Hitchcock, we wanted Paul Kane, like, we wanted all these guys on one. We don't want, we're, like, yes, we got classic records, like, with Kanye and Fabulous, but it was just, it just wasn't that Desert Storm mixtape feel. I know, I know, I, I can't, I don't know, you know? I, I really don't. I don't know what happened. I guess we were all young. We still trying to figure it out, figure out our way. And yeah. And then the mixtape game kind of changed too. Yeah. Where you kind of came to a complete halt. With like where DJ drama and all that. You just stopped. Yeah. After the DJ drama thing happened, that was a big, big deal, right? You know. That shit's everywhere. As they're getting involved, this is different now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You. <laughs> yeah. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
Exactly. So it's just like everything came to a halt. So we had a lot of different factors that worked kind of against us. You know, being consistent on those clues helped a lot, obviously. Yeah. So with that thing and just stopping automatically, it was like, whoa, like, you know, and then we're still trying to put out our content. But, you know, now you don't have that platform that you had before. You yeah. know, so it just uh, difficult. It was definitely difficult when we each had to, uh, you know, hit the reset button and just reconsider some things, you know. Well, but, I, you know, you learn from your mistakes. You learn from experience. Yeah. So those, you those you things learn. that happen. Now, um, is it true that you graduated from Teaneck High? That's when you first went to Yeah, I graduated from Teaneck High School, yeah. I went to Lincoln High School my freshman and sophomore year. And then my mom's got remarried and she moved to Teaneck, which is like the Burbs. And um, Still in yeah, I, was able, I was able to meet a lot of artists there. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of rap. I, I, actually, when I first moved to Teaneck, Biggie lived there. Uh, oh, little wow. Kim, I used to run into Junior Mafia and them all the time, Little C's. And that was like when he died, though, you know what I'm saying? He got killed. So it was like crazy because people used to see him all the time. Yeah. And Teaneck and I just moved in. So I was like, wow, like there's artists really here. Like I'm on Teaneck Road going to the barbershop and, and Junior yeah. Mafia. <laughs> little you know, C's right here. Exactly. Corrupt. I ran into Corrupt. Damn. And T-neck, I'm just like, yo, like, you know what I'm saying? Lady Luck, obviously, she had just got her deal. You know, not to name drop anything like that, but yeah. it just was the, you know, it was a place where I'm like, wow, like, the artists are really here. You know what I'm saying? Ronald Isley, like, legendary wow. people. Oh, well, it was like, that. wow, like, yo, this is it's popping over here. <laughs> That's when I really started taking that music seriously, because I'm like, yo, they eat, and they got some nice crib, DMX. Had a crib with in T neck with with mad dogs. <laughs> yeah, I can I can imagine. Yeah, these cats is all right here. I'm not going nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, yeah, I, I did my uh my junior year and my senior year in T neck, and I loved it because every summer, I mean, you leaving from school, you running into these people, you seeing these people is a lot of opportunity. You know what I'm saying? To really like just start spitting for them right then and there. You know what I'm saying? Back when and, it, like, it wasn't that love, style. Like back then, like where you can actually run up to somebody and they'll hear you. I was like, let exactly me hear because it. They, yeah, they right there in front of you. You could actually be like, and just go. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And then press them real quick. So that was pretty dope. That was pretty dope. Teaneck is, is uh, I got mad love for Teaneck, but it's really my Jersey City style that made them feel feel me you know what i'm saying the way that i rap the way that i talk my yeah, lingo different. they just knew i wasn't from new york because a lot of them are new yorkers that moved from new york once their parents made it and they moved to the suburbs across the gwb you know what i'm saying so that's really what it was and then once they get to know me it's just like yo we like this kid's style and that's how i was able to you know maintain a lot of friendships and get to, to meet a lot of new people but I still always, you know, I'm that Jersey City boy. I was still back and forth to Jersey City, but oh, yeah. yeah. Love T-Neck, though, too. Well, the reason why I brought up T-Neck was because um, I didn't want to, like, name drop him at the beginning of the interview because I wanted to him to have his own segment with you now. Um, mm -hmm. Is that where you met Stack Bundles? No, I met Stack Bundles. I didn't meet Stack Bundles in uh I didn't meet Stack Bundles in T-Neck at all. I met Stack Bundles in... Uh, how did I meet? I met Stack Bundles through DJ Clue. Oh. Stack Bundles, but like he was that guy. Like, <laughs> yeah. He was like, the Stack Bundles. So, like, that was one of the first people that Clue bought to, because Clue was already doing some work with Stack Bundles before anybody ever heard of the 18. Yeah. He was already on, like, the, on the radio, on the mixtapes. He the was like, big more mixtape he had with DJ Clue. Yeah. And Stacks would, I already knew the voice, but I never met him. So, who brought him to the studio on the day we met. We just was like brothers ever since. We were mad cool. He had his whole ride squad with him. You know what I'm saying? Rest in peace to Chinks, too. Very cool guy. Bino. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I know those guys. I rock with them. And uh, got mad love and respect for them. But Stax, that was his boys. Like, that's that was his dudes. They held him down. And um, I actually met him through Clue. Clue brought him to the studio. And then after that, we used to go to studio sessions in Queens. And go out there and meet up with him in Queens and do some studio sessions out there with him. And then he would come to our studio and just vice versa. He also would, used to frequent Jersey City a lot, too. You know, Stax was a playboy, so yeah. he used to move around. He'd be dolo. 
it just pop up like, yo, y'all in the stew, I'm in Jersey City. Like, yo, what you doing in Jersey City, man? He coming from saying to join us up, man. <laughs> He'll come and we'll create. Yeah, you know what I mean? Shouts out to Stack Bundles. Rest in peace, man. He was a talented individual, man. Never wrote. Like, the way this dude works in the studio was crazy. Like, on some Jay-Z type of shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, he never wrote. He'd just jump in there. He, you just got to give him a moment. He'd get it together. And he'd get in there and he just let it go. You know what I'm saying? He has a lot of... Uh, somebody needs to really do a documentary on him. There's a lot of information people don't know about Stack Stack. You know what I'm saying? That... He's a deep dude, too. He, he's a legend. You know what I'm saying? He got a lot of uh, backstories that people probably would not know. You know what I'm saying? I know a few of them. And I was, like, shocked to learn learn some of them. You know what I'm saying? Like, history with Lupe Fiasco, things of that nature, yeah. being part of that label, like, before he was messing with Clue. And, you know, he has origins. Like, he got a story to tell. And then, and then like, I'm sure somebody will put it together. Yeah, him. because, like, I'm observant of it. Because I can only imagine, like, what Clue has with you guys at his hard drive just sitting there because I'm pretty sure like he does have a lot of un unreleased music featuring you guys now because like there's even a mixtape when uh when the animals attack mixtape like that was like shit right there that mixtape you guys got to join on there called uh War I believe yeah that's one of my favorite records that we did with him yeah War that that beat was crazy i can hear it in my head right now <laughs> yeah that was dope man Do, doing that session yeah i was able to make a lot of different records with stack bundles y'all you know what i'm saying that's one thing that i can say that you know that's that's just love that's dope you know what i'm saying i can say that and other people can't because you know they're not able to make any records with them i was able to do that you know what yeah. i'm saying I, you know what i'm saying I, I was able to do that and actually like that's, build with him like that's why i wanted to ask like uh, what's your favorite memory were if you and stack bundles um, whenever I think of Stack Bones, will be I'm honest with you. I don't. I don't. I was the memory. Let me. Let me think. I think. Take your time. When somebody asked me about Stack Bundles, I always see this vision of when he came to Jersey City, right? And uh, it was for Joe Button's video shoot, right? So Joe Button's was shooting a video. I forget what song it was for. It was like a party record. It was oh. the song that he did with Busta Rhymes. Fire! Fire! That's what it's called. He did that song with Busta Rhymes. So whenever I think of Stacks, I just remember him. Academics was popping at that time. The Clover the, Line. The Clover Academics, right? So I just remember him having, he was academics out with these tags hanging from him. All the clothes was brand new. He just was crispy. But I just recall him walking down the hill. Um, It was in Jersey City. What block is that? I don't even know what block it is, but the block was closed off. Buster had just pulled up. And I just see him with the hat on, with the academics. I always see that stack bundles in my mind when somebody asked me about him. It was just, he was looking like a star. He was just in his bag. And he just was walking down the hill, like approaching the video shoot where we were at. And, you know, he's just stacks. He's just, I also have memories with him in the Cherry Lounge. I remember the Cherry Lounge. It's crazy. You know, he used to be minked out. You'll find some pictures of him online. I see some pictures you know, of him with the minked out. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, those are Cherry Lounge pictures. So at that time, Clue was doing a Cherry Lounge. I believe that was in Harlem somewhere. And, um, yeah, we have a lot of nights like that, Cherry Lounge nights, going to Cherry Lounge and just styling on them, you know, coming through. That's how I remember Stacks. You know what I'm saying? Always happy, always cool. Just a real genuine dude. You know what I'm saying? A real genuine guy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like I'm like I'm pretty sure when you hear like some of like your music that you've done together now, it's like damn, you know, like I, I miss that dude. Yeah, I definitely do. I definitely do miss it, the camaraderie and everything. But you know, that's how life goes. You got to learn from these uh, situations. You know, what I'm saying that's what I try to do. You know, everything happens. You know, for a reason. We just have to really figure it out. You know, I. You know, my life is my life. Everybody has their different paths in life. You know, what I'm saying. Unfortunately, you know what I'm saying, for Stacks, that was an unfortunate situation. It should have never happened. Same shit, like with Nipsey Hussle. Like, I don't understand yeah. it. The pop smokes. You know, like, why is this like a deaf culture? Why? Why do we, you know, kill each other when we make it, like, our own? I just don't get it. You don't see that in, 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 in any other genre of music. You don't see this happening. So this is a question that we got to ask ourselves as well. Like, why? Why is this happening? And why is it accepted? Why is it like, you know what I'm saying? So it's just strange. But I feel like we all have our paths and we have to learn from these situations how to, you know, get be better. How to be better, 
You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to do. Like with my music and these interviews, I try to give a little bit of light. Not to be corny or anything like that. I'm no, just no, mature. No. I'm older, obviously. But I feel like this is necessary. Like the youth need to hear that. So that, you know, we got to change our ways. You know what I mean? It's unacceptable. You know what I'm saying? It's not accepted. I get the music. You know, people want to drill them. You know what I mean? And spin the block. It's all good. You know what I'm saying? But we got to we gotta do better. You know what I'm saying? And as a coach, we got to do better. Yeah, that's that's big facts right there. Because like I noticed, like they won't gravitate toward you as much. Like, see, with you and Stack, it's different, right? Because you guys were having that bond and connection. But when somebody dies and, you, and they didn't really know him, and you see like them like kind of do it, it's like, but how come you didn't celebrate him while he was here with us? Like how we did. So it's like what you said now. It's like, why do we celebrate this death culture? Exactly. Why? It's just a, it's just strange. So strange to me. You know, still trying to figure it out. It's like it's not acceptable. When you were coming together now too with your own solo project now too, um, I remember like there was talks on like an H2O project, but it did come out. It's called. It came out under Day Today, I believe. Yep, it's called. It, no, what'd you say? Day to Day. Yeah, or Day Two Day or something like that. It's been a while since I heard the project. Yeah, day to day is a pro is a song that I actually had on. Um, I don't day to day wasn't on H two O. Day to day was an, an original song, um, and I believe that's on. That might have been on Hitchcock Presents. That might have been on my first project actually. That okay. was a song that was on Hitchcock Presents called Day to Day. It was just based. You know, I had just got my just had my daughter. I think my daughter was like one years old at the time, so I had made a song inspired by her and it was just called day to day basically living my life day to day and you know putting yourself at risk and because you know you got to take care of the home you know what i'm saying you got to take care of my responsibilities so that's where that song was inspired from h2o was a project that i did i probably put h2o out in 2009 2009 yeah okay. 2008 2009 i was working with a co with a company called sky high music group and these are some guys that were based out of Virginia, VA. Shouts out to Marty, okay. uh, Marty, uh, I, and then the other member, uh, his name is Black. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that company was run by a dude named Rome, Jerome. And yeah, Sky High Music, basically. So I was, I did that whole project with them. So basically, all of those beats are basically from the same producers. And uh, okay. we were working with Violator at the time, Stingray productions or stingray management basically so stingray was kind of managing me at the time we weren't re really officially on paperwork but we were able to use a lot of violators resources so you know he was able to get me and provide me with a photo shoot he was able to provide me to get the project mixed down he was able to you know basically use those resources and put that project out and it's called h2o you know what i'm saying it's hosted by nelly nell dj nelly nell I went back to get Nelly now, and you'll hear him screaming all over it. And, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some jewels in there. Okay, because I might have downloaded the wrong project on that Piff, because you know how, if you ever, if for the people listening, if you ever use that Piff, sometimes it's a little bit all over the place right now. So, because I remember there was the project H2O now, too. I just wasn't too sure if it was called Day to Day H2O. But this is why, like I said before, this is why I love when artists do interviews, because if you're trying to find some of these old mixtapes now, it would be hard as hell to find a dad piff because they took a lot of things down. Yeah, they took a lot of stuff down on that piff. I, I mean, I could give y'all a, a. There's a link that I, someone sent me before. There's a lot of fans that put this music together, though. People who acquired the CDs, or and they just put this stuff all together, and uh, you know that's why it gets mixed up like that. Day to day, H two O. They name it whatever they're naming it, whatever their favorite songs are. Really, <laughs> they yeah, upload H2O, it. H2O, what was a separate project day to day is just a song okay. but there's a link that you can google and it's jerseys 18 and uh is j e r z e y s and then 18 a t e a m jerseys 18 and you could put like hitchcock and ransom when you google search that sound click will pop up so it's on soundclick.com and like all of these old records pop up so somebody put all of these records on that particular site. I guess it's on soundclick.com. And um, 
yeah, that's where you can find a lot of the old records. And there's a bunch of mixed up records from everywhere. You'll find some records from H2O on there. You'll find records from Hitchcock Presents on there. And it's just a, a, so many different records on there. <laughs> well, it's like what you said now, too, because I remember, I forget what mixtape it was on now, too, because what are you, it's actually your, one of your favorite verses you said now, too. I remember, like, when I really, when I when I was really hyped up is when I heard your verse on, like, Family Reunion. Like, I lost my shit when I heard, like, the reunion of Eddie Timo. And I was like, whoa! Did, okay, I Hitch didn't spend, like, no, 16. He actually got off on that, like, with a whole 32 bars or something like that. Yeah, I had to get off on that. Joe Buttons definitely gave me an opportunity to, to get on the record and kill it. And I was inactive for a while. You know, people have didn't hear from me. Yeah. In a long period of time. So they were shocked just to hear me on that record. And yet I was on a move music, I believe, move music three. Yeah. And I had to, you know, let them let the fans know that I still got it. I've never lost it. You know what I'm saying? I just oh, was yeah. in that and dealing with other things at the time. So I'm just trying to remain consistent now at this point. I have a message and I have a target audience that I'm targeting. You know, I have a direction and I think that's what's necessary. You know, when you have a direction and you make the music much more easier and just pure. And um, yeah, I'm just excited. I'm excited for this new project that I'm putting together for y'all. And I'm sure that you guys will enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Well, we always been a fan of you. Like, because like, I remember like before how social media was today, I remember like looking for you for a bit and I couldn't find you until like you came, like you recently came back to social media recently from my understanding. Yes, yes, I do. I, I just went ghost and just disappear for a moment. I like to do that. You know, just... That's understandable. I'm a, I'm a spiritual guy, you know what I'm saying? So I just try to, you know, get in touch with reality. You know, the, the technology and all of this social media stuff, it really can be a distraction. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's, like, competing and in competition with one another and seeing what the next guy is doing. It's like when you remove yourself from that, you're really in, not in competition with anybody or you're not... You're not influenced by anything. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That it's good when you remove yourself sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Do a cleansing. And then that's why I feel like now I, ha I know what my direction is. I know who my target audience is. I know what, I, what I'm supposed to do at this point. You know, there's no confusion. You know what I'm saying? And that's what social media can do. You watch what, what's succeeding, but that's succeeding for that person. That doesn't mean that that's what everybody else has to do. And that's the reason why we see so many of these artists and they're all alike. They're all the same. They all look the same. They all sound the same. They dress the same. It's because of it. You know what I'm saying? So it could be like a gift and a curse, you know, this social media thing. People watching one another and, you know, it, you, you start to lose your, uh, you know, what makes you you. Exactly. They get so caught up in the online world, it's like they forget who they really are. It's like, dude, put the device down and, like, go outside. Yes, exactly, <laughs> right? It's like the kids nowadays, they'd rather watch a YouTube video of a kid opening up a new toy and playing with it. Rather yeah, than yeah. <laughs> like, what is going on or, out here? Or, or like, or they watch the kid open the toy they don't even want the toy no more <laughs> they want to watch somebody else open it up and playing with it and they get some type of joy out of that that is weird to me even like playing <laughs> video games they watch all the kids play video games nowadays like what the exactly. hell you don't want to play the game yourself <laughs> <laughs> um have you ever heard the the say that we were the last generation to go outside yeah i definitely have heard that you know we the kids that used to go outside and play free for all and tops we used to make our own tops with the wax and you know what i'm saying like really was outside active i mean we used to battle back then so yeah. we go to another person's block and i mean back then everybody wasn't an artist you know you had a bunch of bystanders yeah. like if you go a block it was one or two rappers that rapped and represented that entire block and everybody else just backed those guys up so we used to go to different blocks and battle and stuff like that, block parties to go and battle against whoever were their best. And we just was way more active back in the day. You know what I'm saying? Way more active and, and really social. See, this yeah. whole technology messed the whole social wave up. You know what I'm saying? Because now that's what social is, is social media. Yeah. But people lose, you know, their social skills, their real social skills, because, you know, it's easy to hide behind a freaking computer. Oh, or, yeah. It's your image and stuff like that. It's just weird times we living in, but 
obviously things have to evolve and we can't stop the evolution of things, but you know, we could try to change with the times. I'm still learning. As I go along, you yeah, know what I'm be, be you both, brother. Be you both. I'm still, I'm still be like due to this technology and shit. Like I didn't know, like you could video call and stuff like that. To like a couple of years ago, I'm like, you had video call on the internet. Like, mind you, I was like, I was like behind a little bit. But like, once you get caught up, it's like, wow, like there's a whole yeah. different world out. It's like the Matrix. Yeah, that's why I have my wife. She's handling all of this technology and stuff. She does marketing and she does all of this type of jazz. So. She's the one that's really got me on point with all of this stuff, and she's really assisting me. She's a great help to me doing all of this, uh, you know, social stuff and having all of these links. And, I mean, I, I see why people hire teams for this. Oh, yeah. It, it, it could be a bit much. I mean, you see how long it took us to get, get on the video. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but see, and like another thing, like what I like now, too, is like the humbleness to you now, too, because like I interviewed like – Many artists in my day now, and I'm grateful for every single one, and they're all very humble right now. But there's some artists that I tried to get interviews with, and they're like, oh, I'm too good for you, blah, blah. It's like, well, I'm like, man, like, I'm not going to, like, like bombard you and stuff like that. I just want to ask you honest questions and stuff like that. But yeah. but for you, like, you actually lived a life that so many people can dream of, like, like with DJ Clue. Like, honestly, like, I ain't going to front, because I'm maybe I'm a little bit younger, but if I was, like, maybe, like, Sign DJ Clue, like, I'll be a little bit cocky to somebody. I'm like, man, I'm stuck at signing DJ Clue. Uh-huh, that's true. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I'm, it's just in my character to be, hum I'm humble. And yeah. I've, always, I've always been this way, you know what I'm saying? So, because I've seen people make it to the top, and I've seen them get knocked down. So it's like, you know, like, I just learn from others' experience, and I just try not to make the same mistakes that other people make and, you know, just not to be arrogant and that's just being a, a good human being. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like we all have, we all have our humble beginnings. Nobody starts off at the top. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> yeah. the same guys that you're knocking, you know, you, you gotta, when you fall down, you're going to pat, you're going to see those people again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Who knows? Lo, you could be on a radio station and over there, doing whatever, like, you know what I'm saying? You, whatever your dream is, you can achieve it, you can accomplish it, and then what? Those same artists are going to be begging you for, for your platform. So it's just good to embrace people, you know, humble beginnings, be humble, like, you never know where, where, where life will take you or, or the person. So I've just always been this way, always had it, and it, it's worked for me. So I just continue to be that way, you know what I'm saying? Man, like, here, here, like that, it's like, wow, it's like, me and you, we're, not, we're, we're very much alike. Just, you know, we have very different lives, though, but, like, we're far morals. Like, it's like, because I had a couple of people ask me, like, how come you have established legends on your show, but you still go and reach out to, like, the up-and-coming artists or, or somebody that you used to listen to in high school? I'm like, because I genuinely care. I don't care, mm -hmm. like, who you, who it used to be or what you did. It's like, if you did good music, if I had, like, a moment of that, I want to talk to you and see what, like, see what you're up to. What happened with those records? How do you feel today? So this is like, when I said in the beginning, this was like a real treat. I really meant that. Because I was like, dude, I, I grew up with this guy right here. <laughs> That's what's up. That's really what's up. Yeah, I'm glad I'm able to, you know, connect with you and we're able to do this. I'm happy that you, you reached out. You know what I'm saying? I need all the support that I can get. You know what I'm saying? Right about now. And, you know. Oh, don't worry. Um, That's it. I'm appreciative. Well, we're definitely getting to what's coming up next now, too, because I like how you said, like, because you, you always been recording right now, and I remember, like, hearing, like, stories, like, people saying, how come you don't release this? How come you don't release it? But you said time and it was everything right now. So I got to ask right now, like, what inspired you to, like, start releasing music again? Because, like, there had to be something that just went off. It's like, you know what? I want to do something. Like, I don't know if you can see me, but was it, like, something like this that kind of made you want to release new music? Yeah, well, um, well, I, I suffered from a, a close friend of mine. He did music as well. His name was El Nino, uh, the great. They also refer to him as Lumberjack Johnson. I told him I would never call him that, <laughs> but that, that was his his also his AKA, like an alter ego he had. But he he, he suffered from colon cancer, and he kind of died suddenly. And um, basically, this music thing was his dream. But he always has been around like through the 18, through the whole Lady Luck experiences. Like he's always been like a partner of mine that we always used to write rhymes together since we were little children. 
I'm talking about like 15 years old. 15 years old, we used to be writing uh, off a of video game, like off a of Dreamcast, a PlayStation, the first PlayStation that came out. Like we used to get instrumental CDs and write to it. So, you know, with his passing and me seeing him pass, and that was, that's a terrible uh, disease, man, the colon cancer yeah. thing. And just watching him kind of pass away like that, I kind of looked at my life differently. You know what I'm saying? Got more spiritually attached. Uh, well, more spiritually in tune, you know, seeing things and opportunities in front of me that I'm ignoring. And it's like, damn, like I need to take full advantage of my opportunities and my blessings. You know, my man's ain't no longer here. You know what I'm saying? I have to really try to live my life to the fullest. You know what I'm saying? And also the, the 18 thing was uh, coming to its 20 year anniversary. So a lot of people were kind of requesting me on Instagram and stuff. And I was inactive for a very long time. And I was like, you know what? Like, let me drop a record. You know what I'm saying? I was, let me just drop a record to see if people will listen. And that's when I dropped the Patina record. You know, that's available on all social platforms. And um, once I dropped the Patina record, immediately someone did a lyric video to it. And then it, it just basically went viral. Once the lyric video came out, everybody started reposting it. People started downloading it. And then my Instagram just went crazy, and it was just like, damn, like, I'm back from that. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> yeah. So just from that one record, Bettina, I was like, okay, now I'm going to drop a couple of more records. I had another record, which is called Severance. And that's basically was me talking to the fans about, you know, me separating ties with the music industry. Why, why I went ghost? Why did I separate, you know? And why am I back? You know what I'm saying? I never received my severance pay, basically. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it reminded me of that movie, um, Do the Right Thing, after uh, Radio Raheem got killed. And um, basically, you know, how Mookie went back to get his severance pay after he the one that started the fire. So it's just very symbolic, that record, severance. So I figured, let me drop that next. And I dropped that. And then people were like, okay, bars is back. You know, they're really listening. So yeah. Like, okay open to it so i was like all right i want to drop another one and then you know my wife is like you got to put out an album and you know you're gonna keep dropping singles you got to let them you know listen to the records that they love right now give it time to spread and gravitate you know to to, to reach a further uh, audience and i'm like but i got i left my fans without music for so long that i des they deserve for me to drop these records just something that they could bump to for right now while i'm still you know, completing this album, which I'm just basically going through a lot of songs and, you know, I'm going to put some new ones on there. Obviously, I have never released any of it. Oh, yeah. So it, it's basically done. So I'm just wrapping it up and making sure everything is dope for the fans. But yeah, I dropped those three records. The third one is Peter Luga, obviously. Yes, and that's the one I'm doing a music video for. I'm actually starting a video shoot tomorrow. Okay. Uh, for that. And uh, that, so, so those are the three records is Bettina, Severance and then Peter Luga in that order. So I can only imagine like the, the motivation that you got when like the Patina video got like the lyric video and it started going crazy after it's like, yo, people were like were really messing with me. Yeah, it was a, it was a really good feeling, especially with the temperature things over here with the you know, law enforcement and uh yeah. you know the, the, you know, this whole corona thing as well, people were quarantined. It's not as much as like going into the club and partying and being distracted by that type of music. People really have their ears to, and people are listening. So it's like, wow, I, I, like that's what I mean. Everything is timing. I, I would have been going against the grain if I would have dropped records like that earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so it just yeah. dropped when it was supposed to, and it just fit the temperature of things here. And it just was timing. It just was the right time for a record like that, and people. People gravitated to it. People, you know, loved it. And that's what I mean with the timing. Everything is timing. Patience and timing. Also, it was the 20-year anniversary of a Horror Hood Classic. So, yeah. again, you know, it's a relevant time for me to start dropping stuff and, you know, just let my fans know I'm still here, I'm still active, I still got it. Well, like, even, like, I like how you said, like, like timing is everything now, too. And, like, when... I don't know if you listen to Ransom's new stuff now or if you can even see it as vinyl I'm holding right now too, but uh, I really wish that you were on this project called uh, Scene 2 Director's Cut. Like, this was screaming 
for a Hitchcock yeah. feature. Like, like this, this whole album right here, like, like the whole theme with the Hitchcock and then and I know, and it's like totally my thing, right? Like, it's like, I'm a big horror fan too. Like, that's what I do. Like, that that's all I watch. Like, I, I love horror films and that's just my job. Yeah, I love it. And, um, yeah, it's definitely like, I, I definitely see what he's doing and the, and, and the picture he's painting. I, I can definitely hear myself on a lot of those records. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, but again, like, we, we both from Jersey City. We both have some similarities and, especially like in the taste of music and, and in the beats. So you're going to hear that. You know what I'm saying? You're going to hear that. And, and um, That's why I'm yeah, glad we'll you're coming out with this we'll album. Because like, this, like, this is what we've been waiting for, like for a long time from you now too. And like, I really hope it gets the vinyl treatment because I, I am not going to front. I will buy that shit as soon as when it gets announced. As soon as when Hedgecock gets that vinyl announcement, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm in. I need that. Yeah, no, we definitely working on that. It's gonna be available, you know, digitally. We're gonna have physical copies and also vinyl. Yep, that's gonna be a definite. We're gonna do some copies on vinyl, definitely. So when it comes to your artistry now too, like I have to ask now too, like, do you like have to like, like do you have to listen to some of your old music or when you know it's time to go in and do something, like you know it's the time, like. I don't need to listen to that. I just want to get this out because it's like somewhat therapeutic for you. Yeah, I always have that feeling where I got to get it out. It's like a therapeutic feeling. I got to get it out on a beat. So, But I'm always writing. So even, sometimes I write without a beat even. You know, usually okay. I love creating. You know, when I go to the studio and I'm there with a producer and he's making the beat, I could create on a spot. I love that. But I also love when my stuff is also like premeditated as far as, like, I just feel like I'm a poet because I, I'm always writing. So it could be on a beat. It could be without a beat. It could just could be a story or a situation. And I'm just writing it in a rap form, you know? So those ones, I feel like I really execute. Those. That's how I got the name Hitchcock, obviously, right? Yes. Talking from a point of view. So I feel like those ones are kind of like premeditated murder. When I go into the studio, I know I'm about to kill something. It's just about what beat it's going to be on. You know what I'm saying? Which like beat that. is fit like for what I already have in my brain because it's already locked and loaded, memorized, it's perfected. You know what I'm saying? That's different from creating, going in the studio and then you're writing to the beat. Obviously, I, I'm a professional, so I can get in there, write to the beat, and I can still express it as if it's something that, I, that I've that known or memorized already, even if I just wrote it. So my brain is already like, it, it, I'm quick on my feet with it. But I feel like those are some of my best records, like the window panes, the day to days. These are like well thought out records that I might have sat with for a couple of days. And, you know, and then when I express it, those are always people's favorite records. It's because those are the ones that I'm writing in that in that style, you know, premeditated, basically, really perfected. I like how you said that, the, the whole premeditated, uh, I'm about to go on the car. I like that right there. I hope you sample that. That was fire right there. Um, yeah. So when you're like coming into music, and then like what you said, like into the, it's the 20 year anniversary of the Hard Hearing Class, I didn't even know that you said that. So with that being said, like I didn't even have this in my notes, but uh, so I got to ask, with it being the, the 20 year anniversary now, have you two ever talked about like maybe doing something together? Like not even yeah, like we, a full project, like even we, just a, like a reunion song. No, we definitely have spoken about it. Um, we just have to execute it. That's it. You know, I guess, like I said, everything is timing. Yeah. I'm not really trying to put a rush on him. And he also has it. You know, I have my thing. I I'm, I'm, I want to show what I can do alone first. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. this is because I know what I'm capable of. Yeah. So it's just, and I want to show my fans, like, look, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need to jump on a A-team project to be recognized. When you, you can stand alone on your own. I was Hitchcock before the A-team. So that's what we, you know, I, I've been in many different situations before the A-team situation. It's just a majority of people know me from the A-team situation. Yeah. But a lot of my connections and people that I've met, I've met them as Hitchcock way before that situation has ever happened. So I, I'm confident and I'm sure that, you know, I know what I can do as far as alone. But I also know what the fans love as well. They want to hear that project and they want to hear that come out. And, you know, I feel like they deserve it, and I'm up for it. I'm willing to do it. I've spoke to him about it, and I guess it's just like a waiting game. We'll see what happens, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure that, 
you know, it's something, we would do something, you know. There's also records out there that we have done in the past, you know, after the whole 18 thing. I did a few records for him yeah. um, for his mixtape where, you know, he's reached out and I, I've done a couple of verses and it's been put out there. One of them is called Stairway to Heaven. Uh, there's another record that I had did and he also put that one out as well. But, um, yeah, I don't have a problem working with Ransom in the future and us putting together something. You know, there's no beef or nothing like that. People assume that there's some type of beef or something happened. Nothing really happened. I just think growth happened. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We kind of grew apart and we're different people. We're not the same people who we were back then, but obviously we're both skilled in this rap shit. So people want to hear that combo happen, that one-two punch. And you know, like, um, I don't know if you listen to Joe's podcast now, too, but he listens to, like, a lot of the music that Ransom does, and he brings you guys up a lot sometimes now, too. So you know he's going to check your stuff out when he when you drop your solo project, and he's going to pump that out to the fans. Because, like, I listen to his podcast all this one inspired this now, too, sort of now, too, because, like, when I hear him, like, talk about, like, the A-team and stuff like that, it's like, oh, my God, you're taking me back. So, like... When you drop your solo project, you know, I, I know he's going to have that face like, ooh, that was my yeah. guy. Yeah, man. That's that's my guy, Joe Buttons, man. You know, he's talented. He's articulate. I love working with him as well, you know what I'm saying, in the studio because you know he's going to come with the fire, you know what I'm saying? So you just want to make sure you on your A game with that. So a lot of my best verses is, is on features with them. That's why, you know, because you know what they, what they coming with. Yeah. So it's like... Can't, I can't be coming sideways or weak. I got to come strong. You know what I'm saying? Pause. <laughs> you know yeah, saying? yeah, that big part. Yes, sir. That sounds crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate pause. But, yeah, you know, you got to come You got to come with your A game when, when you're dealing with those type of artists. You know what I'm saying? These artists don't play no games when they come down to that. And, you know, let's see what happens, you know, with me doing what I'm doing. And I just want to inspire all the real spitters that come out and play. Basically, Ooh. you know what I'm saying? Let's they listening right now, and I feel like we have an opportunity. It's a whole lane that's just totally being ignored as far as real rap goes, real bars. You know what I'm saying? I'm not nothing, I'm not hating on a new wave of music. It, that's the new wave of music is always going to be the new wave of music, but there's a total, you know, this bar game that that, that we spit, there's an open lane for it right now, and I'm just trying to come and execute basically, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, because, like, this is, like, a renaissance we're going through right now, too, and I think, like, it has to do with, like, <clears throat> a lot of the things that Griselda and Rock Marciano did in the 2010s now, too, because, like, there was a time where music was shifting, like, this was, like, around the time, like, 2009, where, like, it went from, like, hard-hitting club beats, and then you go to these, like, hi-hat beats where it sounds like a more robotic sound. So I don't know, like, the right term for it, right? But you know what I mean, like that... <laughs> Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But yeah, I like those artists like Rock Marciano and, and Griselda. They, they definitely are are spitters, and they, and they do it. That's kind of more in our lane, like more our style. Yeah. Of you know, what I'm saying I definitely do listen to some of those guys, and um, yeah, I like what they're doing. I like their beat selection, just those yeah. type of old, gritty, grimy, soul. Yeah. Like. It's the music just touch you different. You know what I'm saying? It's just a different type of vibe. You know, so I, I definitely like those artists. And um, I'm definitely going to come with some fire on this this new project that I'm putting together. And you're definitely going to hear some hard-hitting beats. And I'm not playing no games. We're not doing that type of style. We're doing our thing. Yes, sir. And I, I, I'm already seeing it right now. I'm already seeing the great reception right now ahead of time. So, yeah, I can't wait yeah, for this. Yeah. That's just the, you know what I'm saying? That's just the appetizer right there. It's the Tina, <laughs> Severance, and Peter Luger. So you already know what it's hitting for. Oh, yeah. You get those three records and know right away, like, yo, I, I've had that all the time on my DM. My, I mean, because I'm mostly active on Instagram now because it's just very easy for me to post a picture. Or, yeah. Uh, for me to, you know, repost people who are just listening to your music and they're DMing you. So a lot of people are DMing me and they're like, yo, like they're ready to purchase the album. <laughs> yeah. like, when is it out? Like, I need the pre-order. Like, they already are, like, requesting it. So we're going to get this done and put this out, man. Damn. Hopefully I can get it done by, you know, 
by September or before September. I mean, my wife is actually, you know, helping me with it. So we just want to do it, you know, the right way, the proper way and let it come out, um, you know, the proper, the proper way. As, as like what you said before, time is everything. What's that? Like what you said before, time is everything. Exactly. Exactly. You get it. So I got, so I won't hold up your time. I have a couple more questions for you, Hitch, and then I'll let you go. So could you tell me about your company, Homage Edition? Oh, Homage Edition is just like, I got into boxing years ago. Not actually boxing, but um, just the sport. I've always been a fan of it. Okay, so, so like we're just watching the matches. Exactly. So a friend of mine, he's from Brooklyn, and he moved to Jersey City. And uh, we used to always argue about fighters. His favorite fighter was uh, Tito Trinidad, Damn. and mine was Bernard Hopkins. This was that year that they were going to fight, and actually Bernard Hopkins beat Tito. It was like an upset victory, and we argued so much about who would win that fight, and Bernard actually won that fight. So the way we used to argue, like our friends was like, yo, y'all need to start a show or do a show or something. And then I guess that's where the idea sprouted in my partner's head, uh, Akeem. His name is Akeem. He's currently doing a show right now. Uh, it's called the Ak and Barack Show. Okay. And he's on like, Sirius XM radio and stuff like that. So basically, I used to do the show with him. What we did was we tried to combine the hip hop, which I obviously in the hip hop side, hip hop with the boxing and kind of merge it together and we did like a little show like a pot we started doing like a podcast on the show was dtf radio that's what we started it on and uh we would talk about boxing and we would talk about hip-hop so obviously i know all the hip-hop stuff <laughs> and he knew a lot about boxing he used to box uh, at gleason's gym years ago you know mike tyson comes from that gym a bunch of other legendary fighters too many to name you know, so basically that's how I got into the whole, you know, doing a boxing show and stuff like that. But, you know, rap is more my lane. So um, I was like, you know, let, let's just try to do more. Let's try to do a, a apparel line or something. Let's try to do some designs and think of some ideas like to really make this pop. I started really getting into the boxing thing because when I was meeting the fighters, they're obviously hip hop fans. So when they learned that I was Hitchcock from the A team. Then a lot of them were like, okay, they, they, will, they will be more uh, enthusiastic to do interviews, basically. Because, yeah. you know, my partner, we didn't have really have a name at that time. You know what I'm saying? So when they like, oh, Hitch, the rapper from 18, <laughs> so we were able to <laughs> yeah, I know him. people to, you know, to come and do interviews with us. And I was shocked. Like, wow, these guys know who I am. Like, so I just was shocked. So it just made me even a bigger fan of the boxing world and stuff. And then, you know, obviously fashion is a part of it. So that's where the clothing came in, the homage edition. Me and my partner came up with that. And I was like, I, I want to be more on the side of this and concentrate on my music. So we got the homage edition and uh, we're coming out with different style shirts. Y'all can find that probably on homage. Let me see where you can find that. At. Or you could just Google it. You can Google homage edition by Sweet Scientist. And uh, basically, it'll pop up. The site will pop up. We I'll put it in the description, man. Do you know where? I got you. Yep, and it's just a boxing apparel line. You, you guys can purchase shirts and, and hats from there. We also, you know, I've been doing a lot of different designs, and we have a bunch of branches of clothing lines. We have the Cowboy Culture. Uh, shouts out to them. We also have uh, Jersey City Originals. You know what I'm saying? And we have the Pillage Apparel line. So we just have a lot of different lines that we're working off of. The homage is specifically for the boxing world. You know what I'm saying? Cowboy yeah. coaches, something different. Jersey City Originals, obviously. And they're all fire designs. So trying to get into that, too. Yeah, so I peeped out the page down there. Like, it's some fly-ass clothing right here. I was like, yeah, I'm going to check this out. Yeah, yeah, definitely trying to get into that fashion side. I mean, you see how Kanye did it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. But we're Hitch going to be more smarter when it comes to that, though. Exactly. Exa oh, no. Yeah, yeah. This guy is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. He did he different, yeah, than what he was then when we first, like, actually heard of him. Yeah, yeah. You know, people change, but it's all good. So Everybody that, okay. has their own character. So I never knew. Wow. Okay, so I just thought that, like, this was just a clover line. I had no idea, like... You were interviewing boxers now, too. So how do you, like, interview, like, somebody you're a fan of? I have to ask. 
how, how, how would I interview them? No, no, yeah, no, 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 no. How, I, how do you like it? Like, do you like, do you enjoy it? Or is it like, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed it, but I did have those moments where I was like, is this for me? Like, uh, you know what I'm saying? I always feel like I'm versatile. Yes. And I could put, whatever I put my mind to, I can do it. I can achieve it. You know, obviously, you know, I was on a radio station in Sirius XM. People go to school to do that and can't even <laughs> yeah. get that job. You know what I'm saying? I was able to get, get hired, actually. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I have no experience at this at all. But it just was an entertaining show, and it was something that, you know, we were just creating something new. And I feel like that's what it was, but I definitely had those moments where I was like, ah, oh, like, I need to be in a booth. Like, I, like <laughs> I just, I, I need to be creating. This is a different type of thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I've, I've, I've had those moments where I felt like, you know, I'd rather be just doing my rap thing and not really running around interviewing fighters. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like, being an interviewer, but there's nothing wrong with doing that, obviously. Oh, no. well, a, lot of those, a lot of those guys are very well paid. Well, well, the reason why I ask now, too, is because, like, I'm starting to see, like, um, a lot of artists turn into, into media, like, we're doing, like, like the drink champs. This is that this is what, like, Joe Budden and uh, Nori, like, this is what really inspired from the desk flow, because I used to listen to these guys as rappers, and then when I see yeah. them interviewing, it's like, it's like, whoa, this is, like, a whole different side of you. I know it's so weird. Like I feel the same way when I watch it, and and so many artists are doing it now. Even some of the artists that might, you know, they're not really famous, but I, I see a lot of people getting into this podcasting and these different platforms. I guess there's, you know, there's ways that you get paid, and some of them are really successful. So I guess that's why they do it. But um, I also try to look at it like this. Think about um, like. Think about like a football commentator, like usually the retired football guys become those guys at the desk. So I kind of look at it like that, like who better to tell you what's going on in a boxing ring, right, than a retired fighter. Yeah. Like Roy Jones is telling you what he sees or what's happening in that moment. So I feel like that's where that transition is happening, where the artist is becoming the interviewer now because they've been there before. And they, they know the ins and outs of it. So I kind of look at it like that, and I believe that's why it's happening that way. And it's like, because they know like how they want to be interviewed. And plus, if they interview like another artist, they'll feel comfortable around them. It's like, oh, well, he used to do what I do. So it's not like, um, it's not like a random journalist, like, um, I don't even like the dude, but it's not like something like a Vlad coming at you. It's like, um, so in Pertinac 13, uh, you did so and so and sold a lot of dope. Uh, could you tell me about the time? Like, we don't want to know about that shit. I know, right? Yeah, sticky. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Because, like, and like, I want to, because I don't get paid for this, right? I do it because the love of it. I never knew that I would go on to interview Black Moon, MOP, Smith & Wesson, Ali Vegas. Like, all of these wow. people that I grew up listening to, like, it's like, like, Keith Murray, this dude hit my phone one day, just like, yo, we just love? I was like, yo, don't take this the wrong way, but is this fucking Keith Murray? He's like, who the fuck do you think it is? Oh. Right? Keith Murray be wild, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, that's what I mean, though. It's like, it's a new age in, in media now, too, and I love to see, this, I just love to see an artist like that, so I really hope you do continue the podcast that you were doing, because, man, I would love to hear, like, you interview some of your old peers, like, I would love to hear you interview Paul Kane. Oh, that, that'll be fire, right? Yeah, Paul Kane, that's fire, I mean, we have some stories, man, we definitely have some stories that we can share. <laughs> yeah, you know? and only, you know? and, and something so, that like, you guys would be comfortable People wasn't there, you know what I mean? We was there, you know what I'm saying? We was there, you know, so we definitely have a lot of stories and things like that to share. As long as it makes sense, you yeah. know what I'm saying? If it makes sense, we can make it happen. It's like what you said. Like, I'm, exactly. I'm open to it all. I'm open to it all. I'm just trying to, st just want to stay active and I'm open to it all. I feel like these stories are necessary. They need to be told, especially for the youth. You know what I'm saying? It's oh, history. Yeah. and You know, if it goes untold, you know, this is what I was telling my wife, you know, like, I don't like to do the name dropping and, and things like that, but I could pass away tomorrow, and if I never said it, then it never happened. Exactly. It's like it never existed. These So what, who's going to tell the story if I don't, right? So it's part of my story. 
so I, I shared I share the information because it's part of the story and it, it's it's been twenty plus years and the story has been untold. So you know that's why I love these platforms. You know, guys like yourself. You know, you're getting the information. You can put it out to the public and, and let people hear it, and it you know they can understand you know what the process, things that that transpired and what we went through uh, to get to the point that we are today. Like these these stories are necessary and they should be told. And it's like because what what my mind saying is like if I'm still looking for stories from these guys in 2015. 2016, 2017, and I'm still not getting anything from it. Well, why not just take the leap and get it yourself? Because there's other people that are going to be looking for it if you are. Exactly, exactly. Smart man. Yes, sir. Anyway, man, I'm just a big fan of this culture, man. Your mixtape told me through some of the roughest times of my life. So, where, so if you actually share some of the stories, man, you know, that means a lot to me right now. So, man. That's what's um, so, I appreciate that. Hey, anytime, Hitch. Um, so this is a question that I ask all my fans, uh, all, my, sorry, all my guests. Um, the reason why I ask this question is because nobody can ever answer this question the same. And when I used to listen to interviews, I used to like to hear the little bit of motivational thing that the guest used to say. Like in an in a interview that, that wasn't on mine, I was like, damn, he only said like that nine seconds of motivation. But God damn, that got me through something. So with that being said, and this can help some of your fans that are listening today if they're going through something. So with that being <laughs> said, do you have any words for somebody in a dark place trying to see the light? Um, stay motivated and always uh, don't take life for granted. You know, so, so you might be in a dark place right now, but there's always somebody in a darker place than you are. So just don't take... Don't take things for granted and just re realize your blessings. You know, a lot of people can't see it, but, you know, there's always somebody in the, in the world that's worse off than you are at the moment that you feel like you're at the bottom. <laughs> there's somebody out there that's worse off. So, you know, we just got to suck it up sometime and try to get in touch with your, with your spiritual side. And um, that's it. That's all you can do. Pray. Like I said, I'm a spiritual person. I pray. I don't know who you pray to, if it's Allah, if it's God, Jehovah, Jesus Christ, whoever it is, just know that, you know, you know, you always have somebody watching out for you. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, just stay motivated and uh, just count your blessings. Yeah, because you never know when you can be gone tomorrow and how people will actually think of you now, too. And it's all about what you leave behind now, too, because God forbid that something will ever happen to us. They will have those positive memories from us. It's like, damn, yo, like, he really lived life. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, don't take your life for granted. Count your blessings. And like I said, my friend, he passed away suddenly. He was only 37 years old. You know what I'm saying? And it was just insane to me. It was like, wow, like, he's, like, no longer here. It still hits me in a weird spot sometimes. I mean, I'm looking at a picture of him right now at my crib, and it's just like, wow. He's really not here. Like he's totally the guy that you would think would still be here. Yeah. So that that could have been me. You know what I'm saying? So you have to live your life to the fullest. You might think you're in a dark place right now, but you're here still. You have an opportunity to get up, kick up, and get to it. You know what I'm saying? Do do what you gotta do. Muscle up. You know, that's all I can say. You know, there's people who are not here who, who don't have that opportunity to be, you know, he can't be here for his sons. You know, I'm here for them, but he can't be there. So you just really have to count your blessings, man. That's facts right there now, too, because, like, you just never know. And sometimes, like, when you when you count your blessings and you look back, it's like, I don't have it so bad. Exactly. And that's what we have to, like, realize. You don't have it so bad. There's people in other countries, like, wow, like, third world countries, yeah. like, you think you suffering, you know what I'm saying? You think you having a bad day. It's like, oh, right? Right. something Wake else. up and look around. Look what's going on around the world. You think you're having a bad day? Do that. And then get back to me. You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then you find Most out it's not so bad. a bad day. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's not that bad compared to what other people are going through in these other countries. Seriously. All the civil wars, the bombings. Like, it's crazy. Ridiculous. Children. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So... You know, we have to really realize, you know, stop, you know, be humble and just really, you know, count your blessings. Like I said, that's the best way I can say it. 
That's it. Well, damn, this was one hell of an interview, Hitch. I gotta admit, man. Well, one of my personal hey. favorites. I'm gonna go on wax and say that it's one of my personal favorites right here. Um, oh, anytime, my guy. Is there anything that you would like to let the people know before I let you go? Something like a little plug in. I'm gonna put in, I'm gonna get the links from Teddy. Anything that you want me to put in the description, I will, I will put it all in the description for you. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I operate mostly off of my Instagram. That's gonna be Hitchcock JC. Okay. And um, you guys can find me there. You can direct message me. You know, I, I make sure I talk to all my fans. If anybody, you know, has questions or they just want to holler, like I make sure I touch out, you know, reach out to everybody. Um, also, if there's any producers that would like to be a part of this new project, you can hit the email True Money Gang E N T. That's at gmail.com. True Money Gang E N T at gmail.com you can send any beats any requests for features things of that nature all goes through that email um that's about it teddy will probably give you the uh copies to the links and that's it man keep rocking on my g's man because like i tell you one thing when y'all when y'all hear his project because i never heard it yet he's still creating it now but when we hear this you know just remember that y'all heard it here first that this project is going to be phenomenal right here so if, that being, so if that being said, just another classic interview from the desk glow. And like I said, it's another dream come true featuring my guy, Hitch. Or Hitchcock, as you guys Word. know him. Word up, it's your boy Hitchcock. Yes. Let it gang!